Thanks, Kevin. Um, as he mentioned earlier, I'm a longtime coach and trainer. I started my Agile journey about 20 years ago. Uh, and along the way, I discovered that of all the things that I did as a coach, the, the one that was trickiest was all that messy people stuff. Why do people do the things they do? And how do we motivate people to, to get better? And, and how do we get people to change? Because that's really the hardest part of what we do as coaches. And that, that journey of trying to discover more about people has taken me on the most fascinating journey into neuroscience, psychology, hypnosis, body language, and a whole bunch of other things. And pretty much everything we're going to talk about tonight comes from those worlds. So a couple of disclaimers right up front. Uh, some of these tips will contradict each other. So consider the context for each one. Consider that not each one is going to be relevant for the, the general picture. Consider where it's used, where it can be useful to you. Uh, second disclaimer is that the slides are more text heavy than I would normally like because the content is dense and I wanted to be able to leave you with something that was relevant. Uh, as we've said, we will be recording this. There are, there's also a web page I'll be sending you to that has all of the links off to various research. So you don't need to take notes if you don't want to. Just remember that there are, you will have uh, information to get to. If you have questions at any time, please ask them. Don't feel you have to hold up, wait uh, till the end for your questions. Just let them go as we go. So to set the context for all of these tips, I wanna just quickly walk through what a retrospective looks like. And if you familiar, if you follow the, the standard format that comes from the, the Larson and Derby book, retrospectives, agile retrospectives, you'll notice that this form, this layout is a little bit different than what they do, but I find it a little bit easier to follow and the tips still fit into their model if you choose to go that way. The main parts of the retro are the, the links or the, the items that are in blue and the black items are the things around it. So before we get started, we've got some pre preparation and logistics. Then we get potentially into an opening or we welcome people, we bring them into the retrospective. Then we get to the meat of it we review what had happened. So if this retrospective was for the purpose of just generally getting better, then we might review the things that have happened since the last time we met. If on the other hand, we're holding this retrospective because we pushed something to production and everything fell apart, and we're now trying to get to learn from that to get better, then what we're reviewing are those things that went wrong, the, the situation that happened. But there's always some kind of a review to figure out, well, what are we looking at? What are we retrospecting on? Then we get into a diverge converge section where we're diverging with all kinds of ideas. We're brainstorming. We're coming up with all kinds of possible things that may or may not be true. And then we are converging, trying to get them down to a smaller set of things that are useful. Finally, we come up with a set of actions that are going to be our experiments going forward. And we may potentially have a closing. We don't always have closing, but we, we may. So these, this is the context for all the tips that are coming, and I've grouped them according to the section they fall into to, to be more helpful to provide a bit of context. The so first of all, we start off with, with preparation and logistics. Have you ever had that experience where you walk into the kitchen only to discover that you can't remember why you walked into the kitchen? We've all had that experience, and it's usually around the kitchen, at least for me it is. It's called the doorway effect. And it has to do with the way we store and retrieve memories. So as I move from one space into another, I move from my living room into my kitchen, my brain thoughtfully packs away all of the information that was relevant for the living room, perhaps where the TV was located or how the couch works. And it packs all of that away because it's no longer relevant. And it unpacks all of those things that are now relevant for the kitchen. What information might be in the refrigerator, where I can find the knives, where I can find or operate the sink, all of these things that are relevant for the kitchen. And most of the time, our brain just does this very quietly and easily, and it does all the right things. It packs away the correct things and it unpacks the correct new things. But every once in a while, our brain gets confused and it ends up packing away the reason that we'd come into this new context. And that's why I can walk into the kitchen and not remember why I walked into the kitchen because my brain just packed away that thing that was the reason for coming in here. So how's that relevant for what we're doing? Well, if we're doing a stand-up, for example, we really need to remember our day-to-day -day context. What were we working on recently? What am I working on now? What are the obstacles that I have? What are the problems that I need to deal with? I need to be able to remember those things. So if I stand up and walk into a different room to do my stand-up, there's a chance that my brain will pack away all the things that I actually needed. A retrospective is the complete opposite of that. 
So unlike the stand-up where I need to remember all of the day-to-day -day details, in a retrospective, I want to deliberately step away from those details. I want to go to a higher level so that I'm thinking more strategically and thinking at a higher level about the problems that are at hand. And so for that reason, I want to move to a different space. I want to get the doorway effect working to my benefit to pack away those things that are not as relevant right now. Well, now in the context of uh, an in-person setup, we can do that by physically getting up and walking into a different room. How do we do that if we're remote? Well, we could do something like having different backgrounds. We could move to a different tool. There might be one tool that we only use for retros and that we don't use for other situations. Uh, it could be that we've just changed the color of things. I had a client once that changed the background color of their login page. They changed it from one shade of blue to what they felt was a more pleasing shade of blue. It was still blue, but it went from blue to blue. And that was enough for the doorway effect to trigger. And the morning after they made that change, the help desk was overwhelmed with people who couldn't remember their passwords because they'd come to the page and it was the wrong shade of blue. And so they couldn't bring up the information they needed, which was their password. So move to a different space, do something different to get you out of your normal day-to-day -day environment. And that's beneficial for the retro. Fear shuts down our prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is the part of our brain that does the higher level logical thinking. And when we get afraid, the prefrontal cortex starts to shut down. When we move into that fight or flight mode, we, the prefrontal cortex just gets completely shut down if we are completely in a panic state. So if I had been walking down the street and all of a sudden a lion jumped out of the bush at me, then I would go into a complete flight or flight response and my prefrontal cortex would shut down completely. If I'm in an environment where maybe my boss is looking over my shoulder, I'm not in quite the same danger, so it doesn't shut down completely, but it shuts down a little bit. It's a sliding scale. But the point is that any level of fear or anxiety makes, makes us less capable of thinking at our higher level best. So we need to make sure that we are removing fear from our retrospective. Well, what might that fear look like? It might be that my boss is in the same room. If I'm in a retro and I'm expected to share some mistakes I made, Oh yeah, I'm the guy that allowed production to go down. Yeah, I'm, I'm the one who did this thing that caused things to go down. Am I really gonna admit that in front of the person who's gonna decide my rating at the end of the year? Well, I might if I have a really good relationship with that person, but if my relationship with that person is not as good, I'm gonna be really reluctant to admit anything because of fear. The moment I have that fear, I'm no longer thinking at my best. So we need to remove fear from the retrospective. This is why as a coach, I will sometimes stand in the doorway and prevent management from entering the retro. Now, usually we try to be a little more diplomatic about it than that, but there have been times that I've stood in the doorway and prevented management from coming through because we need to have a safe space. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that for employees because that could be a career limiting move to physically prevent your boss from entering the room. But as an external coach, that's a risk I take. Uh, so th there are things like that. The other thing that, that's interesting is a lot of teams will take notes during the retro and they'll publish those notes later. Well, if I know that somebody on the team is taking notes that will be made public, again, I'm going to have real reservations about sharing anything that is sensitive. So what I do to resolve that is I will ask the team, is it okay if I share these notes? Or I might just decide not to share notes at all. But either way, I'm very clear about what information is in the room, Vegas rules, and what information is allowed to leave the room. And we do that in order to get everybody to a calmer place so that our prefrontal cortex is not restricted. Uh, I do have another talk on anxiety that goes much deeper into the neuroscience if this one was interesting to you. But I don't wanna go much deeper today. Allocate more time than you think you need. There's an interesting thing about the psychology of a retrospective that we've got these four steps that we have to get through, the, rever the review, the diverge, the converge, and the actions. And if we don't get to the action step all in one session, we'll never get there because you cannot stop it and restart it later. I've tried it, I've seen teams try it, and it just doesn't work. If we get partway through and then we stop, even if all we're stopping for is lunch, we cannot get back to the same place when we return. So you have to allow enough time to get all the way through to the action step if you're going to make this effective at all. 
And that's why I will never ask for less than two hours. I see teams all the time that say, oh, we're going to do half an hour for the retro. Or we're going to do a review and retro all together in an hour. Well, you're taking a chance. Because if you do get to the actions, you're great. But if you don't make it to the actions, you've just wasted everybody's time because you, you will not get back to that same place. And that way that, therefore, that time was wasted. The next step is to bring things along to fidget with. Now, in these days of remote work, everybody's sort of responsible for their own fidget things. I expect right now that you've all got something on your desk that you could play with. Um, I'm not actually looking to see who's playing with what. Oh, okay, Charlie's got something. All right, so we've got some proof. But in a, a setting, when we all get back in the office, it's important that people have something to fidget with because a large segment of the population thinks more effectively if their hands are busy. So all it takes is a pen that you can move around in your hand. Or if you're taking notes, that physical action of taking the notes, uh, putting pipe cleaners out on the table, or in my case, I like to bring Lego. So put Lego out on the table. Anything that allows people to move around and fidget allows them to think more effectively. There is a ton of research on people taking notes longhand versus taking notes on a computer and people who take who actually write their notes out retain a lot more and part of that is that they're moving they're moving more than the people who are typing uh, there are also a number of studies uh, originally i thought there was just one but i found a whole slew of them uh, all about doodling that it turns out that if you are doodling, even if you're doodling the same pattern over and over again, you will retain more about the subject than if you weren't doodling. It doesn't matter what the subject, you don't have to be doodling about the subject, you could be doodling chairs on a, on a talk about retrospectives, and you would still be retaining more than if you didn't doodle at all. A ton of research on that. So allow people to fidget. A lot of times we look at the audience, we say, oh, they're all fidgety, they're not paying any attention they're probably paying better attention. So go with it. The science is very clear that when we are playful, we are more uh, innovative. Uh, it turns out, a little bit of theory here, it turns out that we all have a whole bunch of different personalities. We think of people with multiple personalities as being somehow different and weird, you know, the whole DID or uh, model of that sort of thing. But we all have a typical healthy person has about 150 different personalities of which we cycle through about 10 to 15 on any given day. This is a very normal thing. We call them ego states or sometimes resource states. And these, these ego states, we're flipping between them and they, they bring different capabilities. Different ego states will be more, some will be more creative, some will be better at thinking, some will be better at retaining information, some will be better, better at analytical math type work, some will be better at art. It all depends and we're switching between them all the time. The ego state that I'm in right now as I'm presenting to you is quite different from the ego state that I'm using when I'm down on the floor playing with my cat. They're radically different and we're switching between them all the time. So how do we use this, this knowledge to our benefit in a retrospective? There are things that we can do to encourage different ego states to come to the foreground. And it turns out that our playful ego states are our most powerful learning states. So if I want people to learn, I want them in the playful states. Well, what can I do to get somebody into more of a playful state? Well, I can use priming techniques like putting paper clips, like the ones behind my head here, paper clips with cats on them or dogs or, or airplanes, something fun. Because those fun things, even if it's just a bunch of different colored sticky notes, will bring the playful ego states to the forefront. And those are our more powerful learning states. Uh, priming and nudging are, are the science terms that you would want to Google if you're interested in more of this, things you can do. I do the paperclip trick all the time in person. If I hand out multiple pages, I will always put one of these funny paperclips on it because you, you never know when somebody will get all excited. Oh, dog, I love dogs. And then all of a sudden, now they're in that right state. They're in that right state to learn and to do things. Again, for ego states, consider whether you are participating or facilitating. So this is specifically for the Scrum Masters in the crowd. Often you will facilitate for your own team, but sometimes you want to participate. You want to be the person actually coming in with your feedback. This is what I observe. This, these are the things I want to do. Doing participation and facilitation requires different ego states. You cannot do them both effectively at the same time. You can flip back and forth and you can try to balance them out, 
but inevitably one of them is going to suffer. It's also more difficult on the participants when the person who is holding the space is also in the space. So consider whether you wish to participate or you wish to facilitate. Do one and do it well. It's totally okay for you to ask somebody else to come in and facilitate your retro for you. In fact, I would encourage that if you wish to participate in any way. So an interesting facilitation tip is the person who holds the pen controls the conversation. So in person, this would be a physical pen. If we had a marker and somebody was taking notes up on the whiteboard, I would deliberately ask somebody, I would say, you know, I'd rather that I didn't take the notes because, and I'll make up some excuse and I'll hand the, the, the marker to somebody else. Because I want one of the participants to be taking the notes because if I take notes for you, then they, you don't own them. But if you take the notes, you do own them. So it's a matter of ownership. If the outside guy does it, ah, that's his problem. But now if we take the notes, okay, we just signed up for doing the thing. Now, if you are the scrum master and it's your team that you're facilitating, you're sort of in that limbo state. You're in a bit of a gray area where it might be okay for you to take the notes, but it might not. So I would err on the side of caution and ask one of the team members to take the notes. And that's whether, whether you were actually doing things up on the wall or uh, today in a remote environment, if we are facilitating something on electronic sticky notes, so on a mural board or something, ask somebody else, will you update that card instead of you going in and doing it directly? Uh, Kevin and I did a session with the team uh, the other day where he was doing exactly that with everybody. He'd call out, well, what about this and what about that? Oh, can you so-and-so go and update that card? Because now they own it. Okay, now we get onto the opening. We calibrate the team. Now I'm using calibration here in the sense that we talk about it in therapy, uh, because I have studied some hypnotherapy. And what we're talking about here is knowing the normal state for the people in the room, being able to recognize when something's a little off. If you're coming in and facilitating a room full of strangers, you, have, you can't calibrate them. You don't know what's normal and what's not. But if you work with these people on a regular basis, you get a sense of what's normal and you can recognize immediately if they come into the retro in a bad state. And then you need to be prepared to drop what you were doing and move on to something else. I had a client years ago where I had gone and prepared a fancy retro. I can't remember what, what technique I was gonna use, but I was gonna do this, this thing. And ever, as everybody came into the room, I knew something was up because I'd worked with them before, I'd calibrated them. And as they came into the room, I recognized that whatever I had planned just had to go out the window. And so I sat them down and I said, okay, I can see something's up, just talk to me. And for the next hour, they just vented because there was something on their minds and I could tell right away because I'd calibrated them. So learn to read the team, calibrate them. Consider if you even need an opening or an icebreaker. I, I put it up on the list because a lot of people like to do an opening. They'll do something fun. They'll get somebody into a, a jokey mood uh, or they'll do something to, to introduce new people, whatever it is, this is not the time really for an icebreaker, unless you feel that there's something wrong with the state that the team's in right now. This is not the time for team building. If you need team building, do it another time. The only purpose of this opening is to get the team into the right state to be able to do the work we're doing. So get them in the right ego state. So we want, if the team is down, if they're all stressed, we might do something fun and lively to perk them up and get them into a better state. But really that's about all we wanna do in the opening. We're not trying to get them to know each other. We're not trying to do that team building. We're just getting them into the right state. I would also call it that not everybody likes these. Some people despise doing that, those, those joking uh, openings at the beginning, and you run the risk of turning them off completely and now putting them in entirely the wrong ego state. So now when we get to the retro, they want no part of it. So use the openings cautiously. Now we get to the review. So we want to avoid who and why questions because who and why questions can trigger the amygdala. The amygdala is part of our survival mechanism. It's a little part of our brain about halfway back on the underside. And it has to do with getting us into that fight or flight mode. So when I said before that when the amygdala fires, we shut down the prefrontal cortex, well, that's, that's the amygdala initially triggering that. It sends off the warning signals. We've got a danger here or a problem and it triggers the sympathetic nervous system, which in turn shuts down the prefrontal cortex and it shuts down growth and it triggers cortisol and it gets all kinds of the flood of chemicals going through your body 
getting you into that state so that you can run or fight. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to get people into that fearful state. But who and why questions can really do that. So let's say we're, we're working with the retro because we just pushed something into production and it went poorly. Something went down. It was a bad experience. If I started asking people, well, who caused this server outage? Why wasn't this reviewed? Who did this thing? All of a sudden, I'm sending people into a fearful state. And that's exactly what I don't want to do. So in your retro, be very careful about using who and why questions, because they can inadvertently trigger people into a fear response. And now as soon as you've done that, you've lowered their ability to participate in this meeting. What, when, and how are always safer? When did this happen? How did we get to this point? What did we first discover? How did we know this thing? So try to avoid all of those, those who and whys, stick with what, when, and how. The next one is, is, requires a little bit more context. We talk in, uh, in therapy, particularly, about lighting up the neural network. If I want to, if somebody comes in with a fear of sailboats, I'm picking something that people probably won't have a fear of very deliberately. So if somebody comes in with a fear of sailboats and I want to help them get past that fear of sailboats, I have to first get them in the mind space where they're actually thinking about sailboats. And that means at a neurological level, I'm lighting up the neural network. Well, if we want to address something in a retrospective, we have to make it real. We have to light up that neural network. We have to ask questions to get people into the right state. Well, and we noticed that we, the server had gone down or this had happened or this person was out sick and everything fell apart. And we noticed those things. So tell me, what was it like in that moment? Where were you? What did you notice first? Get those questions to light up the right part of the neural network so that we can then have the good conversations about what we want to do next in the retrospective. We want to get real tangible actions coming out of this. And that means we first need to make the problem real so that we can come up with solutions for it. Oh, and the last point here, talk about what actually did happen rather than what should have happened. So then we get to the diverge step. This is where we're brainstorming. We're coming up with all kinds of ideas. Step one, get people moving, if at all possible. We have science showing that brain plasticity and cognitive function are significantly improved by physical activity. So in a room, I will deliberately put sticky notes in the middle of a table where people have to reach for them or put markers against the wall by the whiteboard so people have to stand up and get to them. Anything that causes you to get up and move will improve your brain plasticity and cognitive function. You think more effectively when you're moving. Uh, so having physical objects that need to be reordered. Now, there is an obvious caveat here. Not all people can easily move, and we need to be aware of that. We need to be cognizant of the fact that some people may find it uncomfortable or painful or difficult to do the, this kind of movement. And so we need to be aware of that. But with that caveat, anything that we can do to get people moving will help with all of that thinking that we need to do. The next step is novelty. It turns out that when we are doing divergent thinking, coming up with all kinds of new ideas, brainstorming, coming up with all of that novelty increases that. And there's a study here. This study actually comes up twice in these slides for different purposes. But the first part is that novelty may benefit creative performance when divergent thinking is required. So if we're doing new techniques, we're trying a new approach, something new, novel, and interesting, we will get better ideas during the diverge step. So our retros are used both, uses divergent and convergent thinking. And we want to be using this novelty when we're bringing Bring, doing brainstorming, coming up with all of those interesting ideas. So don't use the same retro style twice in a row. If you did a sailboat, for example, this time around, don't do the sailboat again the next time. Maybe do a starfish, maybe do something with Lego, maybe do something completely different, but try to mix it up. As much novelty as we can get, the better our creative juices will get. And we'll be doing more and more interesting things. During a retro, we're trying to get insights, those real aha moments where we've identified a problem and we say, oh, I see how to fix it. But to get those insights, we require a resting state in the brain. And again, we got science on our side here. Uh, so we need to, to get that, our brain into a resting state. But in today's society, we're not very good at that. You may have noticed about yourself and about other people that the moment I finish focusing on one thing, I reach for my phone immediately or I check my email or I look to see if there's something around me, I pick something up. 
we, we rarely have those moments of boredom anymore because we've constantly got something to keep us entertained. And that prevents us from having the real insights that we need because we need that resting state. And without the resting state, we're not going to get the real insights. It doesn't mean that we're not thinking. We're still thinking, but we're not getting those really powerful aha moments of, oh, I see, that's how you could do it. So in, during a retro concrete suggestions, I would suggest that people ignore their phones. I sometimes talk about this resting state. Uh, we set up conditions so we allow for uncomfortable silences. Sometimes we do silent writing. Everybody write on a sticky note silently before you, you share your idea. Anything that can sort of get us to the edge of boredom so we can get those insights. And everybody is, it hates that moment of boredom because we've, we've trained ourselves to be uncomfortable in that spot. But that's where the aha moments come from. Next is no criticizing during the diverge step because as soon as we start criticizing, we switch hemispheres. Our brains are laid out in such a way that the right hemisphere is where all of our creativity goes in general. I'm overgeneralizing here somewhat. Um, if people who have various kinds of brain injuries will actually repurpose the brains and use different parts at different times, but in a normal healthy person, it is reasonable to assume that the right hemisphere is where creativity is and the left hemisphere is where logic is. So the left hemisphere is all about math, about time, about logic, and the right is all of the creativity. So as we're going through our diverge step and we're brainstorming and coming up with all these ideas, we're totally right side. We're right side dominant. The moment we start to, to criticize and say, no, that couldn't possibly work, now we're switching over to the left side. We're becoming left side dominant. And so once we get into that state of criticism, it's really hard to get back to the creative side again. So that's why we say we want to stay as we're diverging. We, we have a no criticizing rule. We don't want to go to the left side. We want to stay on the right as long as we can. No idea is too crazy. Write everything down that comes to the mind. So now we're going to get weird. If we haven't gotten weird enough already, I'm about to go there. If we consider what, what a brain is, and I'm not going to go through all of these things, but we've got all kinds of neurons and ganglia, and we've got neural cells, and we've got synapses and neurons. We've got all this, this stuff that makes up a brain. And it's a, it's a flood of chemicals that go on. We've got, I think it's 300 different neurotransmitters that are all flowing through the body. There's different chemicals. So the, all of these things, this is what makes up a brain. And we used to believe that we only had one of them, but it turns out we actually have at least three of them. We have one in our head. Well, I suppose two if you count the two hemispheres, but really it's one. We have a head brain, we have a heart brain, and we have one in our gut. The one in our gut is about the size of a cat's brain. And seriously, each one of these does the same thing as our head brain. It does all of this processing. It generates all of the neurotransmitters. It does all these things that are up on the slide for what is a brain because each one of them is a real brain and they're all interconnected and they pass information back and forth. And it's a fairly new phenomenon that we have these. And in fact, for a long time, the people studying the heart brain knew that we had two brains. They knew that we had a head and heart. And the people studying the gut brain knew that we had two, we had the gut and the head. And it's only fairly recently that the gut and the heart people have actually discovered each other. And so now we're talking about us having three brains. But now of course, everybody's hedging and saying, well, we have at least three. Because now that we know we have three and we were convinced before that we didn't, there might even be more of them. So why this is relevant for us, and this book behind my head is a fascinating one if you're interested in going deeper on this one. But why this is relevant for us is that diverging is mostly a head-brain activity. So the head-brain is mostly about self-talk, about imagery, and we use specific language patterns when we're talking about that. So if I am in a meeting and I'm discussing and I say, I think this, and I've considered that, and this makes no sense, and, well, that looks like, or and I ask somebody, you know, what are you thinking? That's all head-brain type stuff. And in the diverge step, we want to be head-brain. So as you as a facilitator might want, if you notice somebody diving into heart-brain or gut-brain, you might start asking head-brain questions. What are you thinking about that? because that might bring them back into the head state so that as we're diverging, we're coming up with more and better ideas. Language patterns are incredibly powerful. And again, I could spend all evening talking about how words direct attention and how language patterns really affect the thinking that we do. We can do some astounding things with that. This is how hypnosis works. It's all about language patterns driving people's attention to various spots. But head brain is where the diverging happens. We'll come back to the other two because they're relevant for later stages. 
during our conversion step, so we've come up with all of these brainstorming, now we're coming down to a smaller set of ideas. We want to avoid novelty here because that same study that we referenced before said that while it helped creative performance during divergent thinking, it actually inhibited creative performance during convergent thinking. So we wanted to do something new and different and, and novel every time on the, uh, when we were diverging. For the converging, we want to do the same old, same old every time. We don't want novelty. We want to do the same thing we've always done. So we want to avoid all of that novelty. And this is why when I run a retro, I'm always looking for a new thing to do in the first part. And I always follow exactly the same steps during the converge step. We always group in this way. We always cluster this way. We always vote in this way because I have a specific pattern. I don't want novelty. I want it to be exactly the same every time. So coming back to the, the three brains, converging is mostly a heart brain activity. The heart is all about values and emotion. So I feel this, or I'm following my heart. This is more important. I'm connected to something or else. If somebody asked, you know, how do you feel about that? What's more important here? This is all heart brain activities and very relevant for the converge step. But again, if you hear people ask saying these things during the diverge step, you might want to bring them back. Once we get to converging, you might want to ask questions. Well, what's more important here? Then we get onto the action step. We want to put our actions on the board. Uh, this is whether you're Scrum or Kanban or any other flavor of Agile or I suppose anything because retrospective is, is useful in any context. Uh, we want to make it visible. So for in the case of a Scrum board, it actually goes in your sprint backlog. In the case of a Kanban board, it just needs to make its way across the board in some reasonable amount of time. And we, we do this because they need to be visible so we talk about them. It's all too, too easy for a team to come up with some actions and then not do them. Well, if you come up with the actions, but you don't do them, you don't get the benefit from them. If you're not getting the benefit, why did you do it in the first place? It was just waste. So we need to put the actions up on the board, make them real and tangible so that people will want to do them. And then talk about them every day during your standup. Pick a small number of actions. It's very easy to become overwhelmed with choice. And although I didn't link to any studies here, there's a lot of studies showing that people get overwhelmed very easily with choices, that the fewer choices we have, the better decisions we can make about things. So if we select 50 actions, we won't do any of them. That's human nature. If we pick one item, we're highly likely to do it. If we pick two items, again, we're likely to do them. So we want a small, small set of actions so that we don't have too many choices, we don't overwhelm our brains, and we'll actually get them to done. The next one, which is similar, we're trying to lower the level of commitment, is to not say this, is, this action is the new way of doing things. Because we, we get this all the time. I had this today with a team where they said, we're going to make this change, and this is just the new way. Well, how about we don't say the new way? How about we say, we're going to try this for two weeks. And at the end of two weeks, we're going to say, did we like that? Did it make us better? All of a sudden, we've lowered the level of commitment. We've made it easier for people to sign up because people have a hard time making a large commitment, but making a small commitment is not so bad because our brains are, are easy to work with this. So when we get to our action step, it's an experiment with a time box. How long are we willing to try this thing? And then we'll stop and we'll reflect. Did it make us better or worse? Now, we said many slides ago to remove why and who from your vocabulary. And now I'm saying you're adding it back in again. So I'm contradicting myself, but I did warn you ahead of time that some of them would contradict others. So why do you think this will make us better is a great question because why has some interesting side effects. I mentioned earlier the negative side of why that it can trigger the amygdala and get people into a state, but why can also cause us to double down on things. So if I noticed if I just noticed that Charlie picked up a pen right now and I say, hey, Charlie, why did you pick up that pen? He would give me a very plausible excuse, even if he truly had no idea why he picked the pen up. Because that's how humans work. He might not have any clue why he picked the pen up, but he would give me a very plausible explanation that he just made up on the fly because that's how our brains work. This is what we do. We come up with justifications. So when, when somebody says we're gonna try this action and I say, and why do you think that'll make you better? I'm just locking them in and making them double down on that, that action. It's an interesting trick 
that we're using to make it more likely that they're actually going to do it. Uh, we need to question our limitations. Uh, all too often, we believe that we are not capable of things, doing things that we really are capable of doing. Um, I like this particular story. Uh, there was a, a point in time that it was not possible to repartition a hard drive without blowing away all the data on it. And yet today, we sort of take that for granted. I need to repartition something, I'll just run some software and it'll resize everything and it's all wonderful. And that's because about 20 years ago, maybe more than that now, uh, these guys came out with an app that would do that. And I met one of the founders of the company shortly after they'd released it at a conference and over drinks, he was explaining to me how they'd come up with the idea and what they were doing with it. And he said something that really stuck with me. He said, all of our competitors knew that this was impossible, so they didn't try. But we were too stupid. We didn't know it was impossible, so we just did it. So think about that. They didn't recognize their own limitations, so they just did the thing. And they opened a whole new market segment. But everybody else knew it wasn't possible, and so they didn't even try. So we need to question our own limitations. All too often in retrospectives, we say, oh, yeah, we'd love to fix this problem, but there's no way we could do that. Well, could you really? Let's think about that. Let's actually work our way through it. Because maybe that thing that you think is a limitation is just you knowing all the reasons why it wouldn't work and not considering the reasons why it would. So always, always question your limitations. Um, real concrete example on that one. I uh, worked with a company a number of years ago where a huge number of their teams were split geographically, where every given team was half in the US and half in India. And they'd done it that way for reasons that made sense to them at the time. And so I suggested to them, well, why don't you reallocate your teams so that you have a full team in the US and a full team in India? And just do that for all your teams. And now you'll be significantly more productive. And everybody said, oh, it wouldn't work. Well, why don't you go and ask management? Oh, I don't know. Management would say no. And this went on for months. That every time I'd run into these people, I'd say, and have you talked to management? Oh, no, no. They said no. Well, really, what, what exactly? Did, well, no, I didn't ask them. Well, why didn't you ask them? Because, of course, they're going to say no. After months of this, finally, one guy came back and he said, you know, I went to management and I asked them. And they said, yeah, OK, do it. After months, months of this. So always, always question your limitations. Actions are gut brain. You knew we were coming to the third brain. Uh, it turns out that serotonin, which is the, the neurotransmitter having to do with action, 95% of the serotonin in your body comes from the gut brain. Just as 50% of the oxytocin, which is our connection drug, comes from the heart brain. So the different things come from different places. The gut is all about action. I'm doing this. My gut reaction is to do that. I'm following my gut. If you ask concrete questions about what's your next step, you're going to gut brain action. You're thinking in the gut brain and you're coming up with reactions from that place and it will help people make decisions. Then we get to our closing. Ensure the team is in a positive state. I, had, I mentioned at the beginning that an opening and a closing are not mandatory. In fact, I will frequently not do them. When we get to a closing in a, a retro that I'm in, more often than not, once we hit the action step, I just say, thank you for your time, and we're done. But sometimes you go through and you do something with a team, and it was really difficult. It was a challenging retro. We talked about a lot of really hard topics, and everybody's just kind of down. I would explicitly take time in the closing to bring everybody back up to a positive state. I will do something concrete to get everybody laughing or get everybody back into that positive state. Laughter is phenomenal. Um, again, not trying to plug my other talks, but my anxiety talk gets a little bit into that. When we laugh, particularly if you get a good belly laugh, your brain releases a flood of neurotransmitters that are all really positive, getting you into that more positive state, allowing you to do action, getting you to that right spot. Laughter is one of the most powerful things. Interestingly, even if you fake it, because your brain can't distinguish between real and fake laughter. And so if you fake laugh, you will still get that same flood of neurotransmitters. That was a little bit off topic, but ensuring that the team is back into a positive state. Uh, one interesting technique I'm gonna leave you with is from clean language. We could have again spent a whole evening just on clean language, um, which I'll be speaking about tomorrow in Toronto for anybody who wants to go and see that. Uh, but the one thing I will talk about is the power switch. 
And this is a really simple language pattern. The and when X, what would you like to have happen? So for example, uh, I meet up with Kevin in the morning and he said, oh, I spilled the coffee all over my hand and I think I burned it. And it's just, it is the most horrible day ever. And I say, and when you spilled the coffee all over your hand and you burned it, what would you like to have happen? It's as simple as that. And when that thing that you were just complaining about, what would you like to have happen? And sometimes people will just look at you with a stranger's look and say, what did you say? And you repeat it again, but it will help get them back into that positive state. It will spin them around, get them to stop focusing on the negative and starting to focus on the positive. It's a really intro, this, this comes out of therapy. It's a really, really interesting technique. Uh, it works well on teenagers too, um, as I can testify from personal use. Uh, I had said, again, we reintroduced why, now we're going to reintroduce who. So we get a little bit more accountability. Who will ensure this item is done? When will we check back in? These are great questions around accountability. Because if we just say to the team generically, oh, will somebody make sure this happens? Then social proof works against us. Social proof is this, non is this idea that I've, I, I feel I should do something, but I look around at everybody else and nobody else is doing anything. Therefore, it must be okay for me to not do anything. That's what social proof is all about. This is why you can see somebody getting beaten up on the sidewalk and everybody stands around as bystanders and does nothing. It's social proof because everybody looks at everybody else and sees that nobody else is doing anything. So it must be okay to not do anything as well. So sometimes social proof can really work against us. This is why if, if you've ever taken uh, first aid training, one of the things they teach you is that when you want somebody to call 911 or to call for an ambulance or do something, they say, point at somebody and say, hey, you call 911. That's to break the, the spell of social proof. So we want to get some level of accountability. We can't just say, hey, will somebody do this? Who specifically will do this? You could say, hey, you to take care of this. But in the case of a retro, we probably all know each other. So it might be easier to just say, hey, will somebody sign up for this? This one, I'm not gonna go deep into, but I, I'm offering it up as a something that you might wanna Google. I, I happen to love this particular diagram. The idea of a cognitive bias is it's a way for our brains to get to answers quickly. So if we try to think through everything from first principles, as astoundingly powerful as our brains are, we couldn't handle all of the load of information coming in. So instead what happens is that we have all of these shortcuts built in that if I see a scenario that I think I've seen before, I shortcut my way to the answer. I get there right away. And we call that a cognitive bias. And we have cognitive biases, hundreds of them for all different purposes. So how we get from specifics, how we discard specifics to form generalities, um, how we store memories differently based on how they were experienced, noticing things that were primed in memory. And you can go your way or all around this chart. All of these are built-in cognitive biases. And sometimes we need to recognize the cognitive biases in ourselves and in others in order to get through them and break through them. Because once we recognize that somebody has jumped to a conclusion, we can start asking questions to get them a little bit deeper and perhaps make them rethink it. But if we don't recognize that it's happening, we have no hope of doing that. So I would encourage you to do a bit of research on cognitive biases. Uh, there's some fascinating ones on this chart. This chart is from Wikipedia. Uh, and everyone that's mentioned on here is also from Wikipedia. So I don't want to belabor this, but just really quickly about me. Um, perhaps uh, Kevin can paste stuff into the, uh, into the chat here. But I, I am a longtime coach and trainer. Uh, there's more about me up at that first link. I have also done all of this stuff into neuroscience and human behavior. And I write about that on Unconscious Agile. There is more about today's topic specifically, all of the information that was on those slides, plus links off to research and such at that URL, which Kevin will be pasting in in a moment. And then, as I said, I am an independent coach. I am available to help your teams. 